All right, off we go, off and running. Stop that, go away. Um, well, again, welcome to the MLS interim. Uh, some links on here. Basically, you can turn your video on if you want. Um, I'm not because my signal here is a little worse than it should be. Uh, please, mute your mute, mute, uh, please mute your microphone unless you're speaking. Uh, try to use a headset to avoid echo. Um, add your name to the affiliations to the blue sheet, which I'll drop in chat in a second. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, so I just dropped the link in the chat there. Um, we have another one scheduled on October 22nd. Actually, that might be the 20th. I may have to update that. Um, it's two Tuesdays from now. And again, MLS Virtual Interim. This is the IETF note. Well, uh, I think everyone here has been to enough of these and knows what this is, but uh, go ahead and go over it anyways. Uh, basically, we have a lot of policies in effect when we're having an, an IETF meeting, and this is actually an official IETF meeting. Um, you know, about participating, you agree to follow the rules. Um, you know, obviously we're recording this as we talked about. Um, the big deal here is that if you have any IPR related to this work that you disclose it um, and all that good stuff. And the other thing is like to behave professionally. Luckily, as I've noted before, this working group does not have that problem. <clears throat> so um, I know that we are recording this, but I still need to put turn in some kind of minutes. Is there any, are there any volunteers to take uh, highlights of the things that we go over, mostly just action points? I, I can do it. That's great. Thank you, Conrad. Um, we don't usually use Jabber, so I guess we can kind of skip that one. And again, I dropped a link in for the blue sheets. Um, I think it, there's not enough of this here that it really matters, but I probably should just continue to state your name when you when you talk. And just a reminder, keep professional. Um, our agenda really is to go over the issue and pull requests, but what I'm probably going to end up doing actually is pulling up uh, Raphael's slides for a projected way forward uh, as we move into IATF 109. Um, unless there's any objections. All righty, let's jump into them. Raphael. The floor is yours. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Uh, yeah, we've been saying that <clears throat> we wanted to come to a preliminary conclusion sometime this fall. And uh, there was this rough consensus that we would chew through all the issues and PRs and GitHub uh, until everything is done. And now with uh, ITF 109 coming closer, the idea was to uh, put up a tentative roadmap to see uh, what that means in more detail. So if we can go to the next slide. So for now, we have two more interim scheduled today and one in two weeks from now. Um, some potential options to schedule some, some more before ITF 109. Um, so the idea is that by the end of October, we complete the current outstanding issues and PRs on GitHub. And we issue draft 10 after that. Um, I think the current draft nine is already expired. Um, so we should really do that. It's not visible anymore on the ITF data tracker. Um, <clears throat> once we have that, we can uh, call what we call the, the last call number one in early November, just before ITF 109. And then we could present that uh, at the plenary and then discuss and collect some feedback if there is any uh, that we receive during the uh, the last call number one and um, and if there is any we can issue another draft 11 in that case uh, if we need to address anything yeah so Raphael, from my perspective if you think and everyone else thinks that we can actually get through all of the open issues and prs and issue a draft by the end of october and issuing you know the, the two-week working group last call which, you know, for most people is, is a wave the flag, like, okay, now it's really time to read the draft and provide comments. I think that'll work. And then um, whatever comments we get, it's exactly the right use of the time at IATF 109 to re resolve any of those. Um, basically, I, I look at kind of working groups last call. There's, there's, not, there's, there's not usually just one. Sometimes there's more than one. And this, the first one just basically kind of flushes out any major issues that people um, haven't really felt the need to the voice or you know haven't gotten around the chance to read it and it brings other people that are interested 
peripherally, but not super involved in this to kind of, you know, focus their attention basically on this. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So the idea is to have another last call afterwards that will be in the next slides. Um, if you can go to the next one. So yeah, post ITF 109, um, potentially we issue a new draft depending on the feedback. Um, but then the important part here really is that we have a feature freeze uh, for some time. So during that phase, uh, we want to focus on implementation and also on analysis. Um, and the goals for that period is to really have multiple implementations. So I think this working group is lacking a little bit behind in the uh, general idea of rough consensus and working code. So we have some code, uh, but it's fair to say that none of that is currently really interoperable. So we really need to get there. I think there's a lot of confidence that uh, it's going to work and just a matter of um, figuring out some details, uh, potentially touching the draft again for that. Um, and then, of course, uh, because MLS is uh, meant to be a secure protocol, we need to leave some time for security analysis, um, particularly because we've been doing a lot of changes in the protocol. Uh, so calling a freeze is really important here because it's a clear signal to the academic community that now it's a time to really look at things and, and nothing major is going to change uh, unless we run into some problems. And after that phase, we can have the second last call. Uh, ideally, that will be the final one. Um, we'll see where we get. So the question there is how long should that phase be? Um, that's an open question for now. That's not something we have to decide right now. But we should have some understanding of how long it is, I think, around the period of uh, ITF 109. So from, uh, from a historical perspective, what we did in TLS 1.3 was actually like six months. It was, it, was a, it was a pretty good length of time. So I don't know uh, if that's too long, too short. Well, we definitely need several months, um, at least for the implementation uh, uh, side. It's not going to happen overnight, and I think analysis might even take uh, longer than the implementation there. I know that there's a number of groups working on analysis from different directions. So that's something to factor in is that uh, there's different, there's a, this is a huge protocol, a lot larger than TLS was, and it's probably good to give a little extra time for all the different types of analysis that are going on. I think it would actually be very helpful. Um, if somebody from the academic community could give an overview of what kind of analysis is going on, who's doing what, uh, what time they project they they would need for that, I think that would be very helpful um, to um, to get a better understanding of how much time we need to factor in for that. So I, I might be able to do that. Uh, not not a broad overview, but at least of some of the results. I mean, uh, some of the pen and paper stuff. Um, when do you think that would be useful to have? Overview. A, a first draft, maybe by the next interim. Could be helpful. I mean, uh, so probably because we'll get more. Uh, We'll get more people at IETF 109 if we have a draft of it for the next interim. And then if you could be prepared to talk about it at the IETF 109 meeting, whenever that's going to end up, or somebody will be uh, available. Because I think that'll it'll be better to give a broader community a sense that we're, where we're going to give us a warm and fuzzy as we progress forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... I guess I so I have some insight into what's going on in the analysis part, but um, I guess, Brita, if you could 
help me figure out what's going on on your end as well. <laughs> and if you know of any other groups that are doing analysis, um, that would be useful. And then I can try and put together a summary. And by next interim, I should know if I've got enough to, you know, to, to actually have a useful summary or not. Does that sound okay? Yeah, I think so. Maybe you could also send a, sorry. Go ahead. I think some of the crippled people can uh, talk offline and try to summarize this. Definitely. So from a, from a working group chair perspective, that's perfect. You guys talk about it. We talk about it briefly to try to, you know, mash it together and then give us a couple of weeks to put things together and figure out if there's anything else. We could put open calls out on the mailing list if we need to. Yeah, I, I talked to, I happen to be talking to, with Karthik about something else. And um, we discussed um, having a call, you know, like once we've got um, a next draft out that we think is pretty much complete, just like having an open call for whatever academics are interested to kind of bring people up to speed on the latest stuff um, as a way to kind of kick off the last round of analysis. Cool, that makes sense. Sure, right. could you maybe send uh, an email to the mailing list as well, um, saying that you're now doing this, see who else might chime in? Absolutely. Yeah, I can do that. So basically, I'll formulate an email that's sort of is a call to, you know, anybody doing analysis, we're trying to compile a, an overview of what's being done, what's being done, and what's going to be done. And anybody who can contribute, please hit me up. That's basically what I'll say. Yep, that's great. Um, Joel, if you'll send that, that's, that's fantastic. All right. Thank you. Uh, I might need two days, though. There's the Eurocrypt deadline coming up on the 8th. And... No no worries. Day job uh, deadlines, uh, you know, are, are, are reasonable. Okay, good. Yep. <laughs> All right. I think there's one more slide. So I tried to put down some rules uh, for this phase after the freeze, um, see if we can get some consensus on that. Um, so I, I tried to categorize the, the changes into two categories. One is, is breaking changes, meaning um, clients wouldn't be able to interpret anymore. The protocol would effectively change and non-breaking changes. So. Non-breaking changes are not a problem during that phase. Um, so I'll try to put on some examples like editorial changes, obviously, uh, functional changes that don't affect the protocol directly, uh, and also extensions if they do not touch the how the core protocol uh, works. Uh, and breaking changes, this is where we have to tread more lightly, otherwise we don't really achieve a freeze. Um, so I, I tried to uh, set the bar at a certain level here, uh, saying that uh, regarding the academic research, what we should really honor, of course, is security flaws, especially when the uh, guarantees that we claim we have in MLS uh, cannot be kept. So that's quite obvious. Um, when, when it comes to improvements of security, that it's probably something we should discuss whether that um, should constitute a, a breaking change or not. Um, and then on the implementation side, um, we have to see how um, easy it is to implement all of that efficiently or whether it's possible at all. In the past, we had a few situations where things were actually not, uh, we were not able to implement things. Um, I think we have a lot of confidence there because both Richard and I have an implementation that is um, almost um, up to date with the, the current uh, draft on GitHub. So I don't expect anything major to pop up here, but you never know. Yeah, so those would essentially be the rules uh, during that phase. So that um, implementers can have some confidence that things are not going to change all the time. And the same goes, of course, with the academic community.
to make sure I understood uh, the ideas for this phase to kick off at I, at the at the ITF 09 meeting or 09 meeting, the next ITF meeting. <laughs> uh, after the the first last call, so even a bit before that, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think okay. the idea is that like we issue draft and based on all the stuff we have right now, we have a first last call to give people a chance to get any get any issues on the table. Then we, you know, if we need to do some updates to, to get to a, a feature freeze sort of state, then we'll, we can issue a draft 11. And, you know, at that point, um, you know, post post first last calls when we would initiate the feature freeze. I mean, I think this this makes sense. I think there's probably some room for wiggle room uh, uh, changes that uh, incur unreasonable engineering costs depending upon the person bearing the cost. But um, I think we can probably work through those. So I think this sounds like a plan going forward. So now the question is, as I switch to um, the pull issues and pull requests for the draft, whether you think that's reasonable. I Cause, think I, Cause we have 18 and I mean, I think it, I think it is, um, but let's, where would we like to start today? I have an easy one to start with, um, which is I'm going to propose not doing stuff. Um, I think number 349 on um, using opaque epoch IDs, um, I'm going to propose we just close that because that's been around for a while. Um, some folks, you know, we got to the point where like it doesn't really matter which side of this we end up on. Um, and there's some operational um, simplicity to having things the way they are. So it doesn't seem like there's a real slam dunk argument to, to make this change. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to close this unless someone really wants to stand their ground and say they, they want to make this change. Fine with me. All right. I am hitting the close button. Sold. How about uh, 396? Are we ready to make a decision on that? Sorry, which one is that? Authenticate group membership in MLS plain text. That's basically adding the Mac. Yeah, I think that one's probably pretty ready to go. So I- There's I, still I, some I, outside, outstanding change requests on that bottom. Okay. So I, I, I looked at it and the time I, I put in a comment that basically we only need it for proposals. We don't need it for the rest. So not for commit, basically. We only needed it for proposals. But I'm not sure if the change was made or not. Let's see. Okay. Oh, I think I think I was. I, I think I agree with with you in principle, but syntactically, it seems awkward to put that up in the. Well, maybe it's not. Oh yeah, it's 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 a bit awkward to put that up with the the membership tag up with the proposal, mm -hmm. um, because. Uh, I, I think the idea was that the membership tag would be the first thing you verify. Um, so in the spirit of kind of verifying from the outside in, mm -hmm. um, you know, having to reach in and get the first thing you verify seems, you know, you're, you're then parsing data that's, that's not verified. It's not, not a huge issue, but, um, it's a bit inelegant. I think so we don't, um, sign the membership tag, but it would be above the signature then, wouldn't it? 
Right. So you need to, there, there would be some awkwardness about that as well. So either you need to sign the membership tag or um, to do some dance where you populate it after the signature. You could put it in its own select statement. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's a few different ways to go about the syntax, but you needed some mechanism like that, yeah. So, yeah. Jo Joel, unless you, you feel real strongly about this, I would be inclined to, to kind of solve this um, in prose by kind of saying that this this tag must be um, must be empty for uh, for commit messages. Sure. I think it, it doesn't harm security to include it also for commit. Um, I think it's just, it's just a pity for the bandwidth. And however you guys think is, you know, the most elegant, like, from an engineering perspective to solve that, whatever that, you know, that, that works for me. Um, yeah, it's really just, it's, it's not a problem to include it for commit messages or to set it to zero or whatever. Um, it's just not necessary. That's also, it would be a pity to waste that. That was really the only observation I was making there. Yeah, I, so I, I think I, I would, what I would not like to have here is like sender, sender decides what to send. I think what I, what I would like to specify, what I would propose we specify is just say that um, if the type is commit, then this must have zero length. Mm-hmm. Or if yeah. type 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 is not proposal. Yeah. Okay. So am I right in understanding that means there we still need a, a revision on that pull request to include the pose? Yeah, I'm I'm adding notes to the pull request as we as we talk about this. Um but I, I should be able to revise this pretty quickly. Nice. Um, Brendan, you said there was something else in here that needed revision or discussion? Uh, yeah, I left some comments above Joel, um, basically asking you to put it in its own section, which I see. And uh, you said something which wasn't quite right, I think. Um, I don't remember what was not right about it. I think if it's this part, you're saying that actually this isn't quite right because the signature doesn't cover the membership token. Uh, yeah, okay, I can revise that. I'll revise that to be clearer. So, so what you're, what you're saying is that the, the signature authenticates the member's identity, but the membership token authenticates the membership in the group. Yeah, yeah. I think the other comment from you, Brennan, was that uh, this should only be needed when uh, MLS plain text is sent over the wire, meaning if you use MLS ciphertext, you don't need that. I think that's actually a, a correct statement. Yeah, I can add that. Yeah, I can make those tweaks um, and then um, Joel and Brennan, I'll, I'll Tag you for re review. Cool. So I think we should really get that one done. So scanning down 336, I think that's just me and Conrad working through the last things. Um, 337. I would propose we kind of hang fire on that until other stuff is done and then take a relook at whether this makes sense. I mean, but the idea is that we're trending that if we go along with the other changes we've made, this one is going to get rejected. I think that's probably the case. 
Okay. Because the things that looked, you know, I think a, a little while ago, it looked like we had multiple parallel inputs um, going into a single derivation, um, which I think has gotten broken up a bit. But like I said, I think we want to get at least 336 done, which is rearranging the key schedule a bit, um, and then reconsider 337. Okay, so for the next interim, I guess our hope is that we can, we'll be looking to close out 336 and 396 at a minimum, and then we can decide on 337. I think we can probably get 336 and 396 done before the next interim, just you know, working out details. And then um, maybe, you know, depending on how discussion goes today, maybe even 406, um, the 402 and 406. Um, so I like, okay. there's, a, there's, there's an off chance we might be done uh, with, with, pull request by the next interim. That would be fantastic. All right, so do you want to go to you want to go to 400 next? Um, yeah, we can do 400 or 402. I haven't reviewed 400, I admit. Brendan, do you want to tee this up? Uh, sure, it's not a very substantive change. I basically just went through and made the security sections uh, section sound a bit nicer to me at least and be a bit more um, clear and sort of accurate as the protocol has changed over time. So it's essentially editorial. Okay, yeah. Conrad, it looks like you have reviewed, done some review here. Did you have any, is there any out, anything outstanding or did you, your stuff get addressed? Um, I think it's a bit optimistic regarding the FS guarantees, the PS, well, not the PCS guarantees, I think, um, but oh, yeah, it's not incorrect. I think it's just a way kind of how you want to, how, how careful you want to be when you phrase it. But then again, we could leave this in as a kind of general thing as Brendan proposed and then be more precise in the architecture document. I think that would be okay. Yeah. I think that would kind of, yeah, it, the, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I said I did kind of cut corners on the actual formal security because, like, I'm not a formal cryptographer. Uh, I was just saying things that gave me the intuition for why the protocol was secure more so. Well, it's I, I think it's just about the why and then about the when. So, I mean, MLS is very intricate with regard to forward secrecy. So, kind of, you can be arbitrarily kind of uh, uh, detailed about when you get which kind of forward secrecy under which circumstances. So uh, in the architecture document, I think we should be very detailed about this, or at least not kind of overstate it and be conservative about our statements. But here, yeah, I don't know. Um, as long as there's a link to the architecture document for kind of more precise information, I'd be okay with this. Yeah. I think if you look at what TLS 1.3 did, they have the, the doc, the, this protocol spec has kind of an overview of the security properties that it provides and points to things like some of the, the academic papers that were published about it for more precise things. And I think we can do the similar approach here where this thing can provide an outline of the properties and then the architecture can have the, the more precise story, more complete story. All right, well, if, All right, so um... nobody has... Yeah, my theory is if nobody has any ma major objections, you can either decide to merge it now or we can, like, you know, make sure you review it before merging it, Richard. And Yeah, uh, if, if there's no major objections, uh, I'll review it and, and okay. work out any, any details with, with Brendan. So let's just do. So again, just for context, this is one of the things that uh, we can also always do later, right? If it's yep. editorial and it doesn't do true breaking changes, um, we don't have this deadline. All right, so I, I, put, me. <laughs> I, I did, and I, I gave Benjamin one as well, as well for giggles, since he's going to write the other draft, um, since he's writing the other um, the, arch the uh, architecture draft. I said he was going to do an update to make sure that we're we're in alignment. But um, yeah, all right, cool. All right, four hundred two or four hundred six. Why don't we do four hundred two? I think that would be shorter Conrad
Conrad, you want to make the argument here? Um, yeah, so here I propose that we, in the draft, we encode the possibility of having uh, credentials that include multiple signature schemes and multiple key pairs. So I don't propose changing the basic credential or X509 or anything, we just kind of just propose to phrase it in such a way that if there's a certificate that contains multiple signature schemes and multiple key pairs, uh, you should pick the one that corresponds to the surface suit of the group and then use that one, essentially. And on a slightly related note, I, I, I'm not sure when it vanished the signature scheme field on the credentials. I think it would be useful to have it in the credentials. I know it's slightly redundant in the context of a group, uh, but I still think it's good to have because credentials might kind of fly around in places where they're not attached to a group, for example, on the AS. And um, sure, if you use it in the context of a group, it's always going to be clear which signature scheme you want to use. But um, I think it's good practice to kind of keep the, the signature scheme information attached to a key, just not to run danger the danger of using it for the wrong scheme, which might kind of end up in strange behavior. Yeah, I think I removed the signature scheme enum when we decided that uh, signature schemes were going to be part of the cipher suite because if within the scope of MLS, you can infer it from the enclosing key package. Um, so rather than allowing a potentially conflicting indicator, I decided to infer it. But I, I, I wouldn't object to adding it back. Your point about the, the, the idea that these credentials might exist elsewhere seems seems compelling. And it, it's really just repeat. Yeah, we're really just reusing an enum from from TLS, um, so it's it's pretty low low complexity. Right. So there's two issues. One is keeping the information there, and the other one is allowing multiple signature schemes. Any opinions on that? I think that's a point that we wouldn't want to allow uh, conflicting indications between the key package and the credential. Like I'm. It's not clear to me that credentials would, well, so I guess they, they might be shared between several key packages. Um, but if you ever like get a credential specifically, it does have to be clear already what signature scheme you need to use for it. So there is one a case where they, you can have multiple schemes inside of that credential, and that's if you're hybriding uh, certificates in any way. And we talk about hybriding post-quantum and standard, uh, but I also happen to know that Microsoft is dealing with this within the standard world, then they actually were looking that this could be very useful to simply hybrid to standard algorithms because they're dealing with long-term backwards compatibility issues. The short version being that if you have a hybrid certificate that's been signed off on from both, for example, post-quantum and a standard scheme, and your key is ready to go, but the certificate actually contains both. And that is the case. So what Conrad is proposing is that if this, the group can only handle um, the standard, then right, that, that's one that everyone has to use in group. But at least you can see that in the certificate. And maybe that certificate can be used across a couple groups. And maybe a different group is able to handle the post quantum. This is just one use case example. So certificates are a different thing entirely. Um, and like the PR right now is only touching uh, the basic credential, which is just a raw, unauthenticated identity key uh, assertion. Um, no, you're going to talk it's about not, cert sorry, it's not even touching the basic credential. It's only saying hmm. that there, if there is a credential that supports multiple signature schemes, then you should pick the one. It's it again. I'm not touching any of the existing credentials. Okay, so. Okay, fair point. Um, but you know, if you're talking about a certificate now, there's a single, you know, this, the subject public key info has a single algorithm identifier on the key. So even in that case, the key, even if it's a compound key, has a specific signature algorithm that it indicates. 
That is correct. So yes. like even certificates don't allow for multiple. Not even yet. If it's a, even if it's even <laughs> if it's a hybrid scheme, well, unless you're going to change, like go go over to the ITU and change X509. So Richard, they're uh, they're looking at doing that now. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. If, if, I think this is a disaster, personally, but I'll <laughs> um, we'll go with whatever the group thinks. I mean, so without weighing in on the merits of these, of having multiple keys for different algorithms in a single credential, um, it seems to me like the things we have right now, basic credential and X509 credential, neither of those allows for multiple algorithms. Um, they both assert a single key and a single algorithm that goes with that key. Um, so if you were going to have support for multiple kiss signature schemes and a credential, then you would uh, need to have a new credential type. And it seems like that new credential type could specify um, how it's used with, um, you know, you basically could specify this, this selection here that, um, of the, the various things specified in the multi-credential, um, you use the one that goes with the the cipher suite. So, so, so a credential. I, I kind of propose we punt on this until we we have a, a specification of something that has multiple signature algorithms. So, you want me to propose something like that? Well, I, I don't. I, I think that could also go very cleanly go in, a, in an extension, a separate spec that would be an extension to this one. I don't think it needs to be in this base protocol. Right, but then the, so, okay, we have the behavior that extensions can change how the spec does, but it's not like the way that uh, credentials are kind of extensible in quotes is that you can add new credentials, but that doesn't mean you can actually, they can, I, I can somehow, by introducing a credential, I can somehow change the spec. For that, I would have to have an extension which goes into the group, which changes the behavior of the spec. So it's not clear to me how that, that would be mandated. Well, maybe. Like, I, I, my kind of mental model of a credential is the thing that has a, a public key. Um, and for, from MLS's perspective, all MLS, MLS, the protocol cares about is the, uh, the public key that's in there. And then the, uh, the application cares about the identity and whatever else is in the credential. So, you know, as long as it's clear for a given type of credential, how you get a public key out of it for the, you know, for the context, uh, you know, for, for a given MLS session, um, right. That's just how you process that type of credential. And there, you know, the implementation is going to have to have logic for processing that kind of credential in any case. And this is just an aspect of that processing. Right, but no, I mean the we're we're pretty much, but but we're de describing how the credential should be processed in the spec. No, that's not externally. Um, that's correct. But the the only processing we specify in the spec is one you know, the, the bytes of how it's included in the key package, which doesn't matter what algorithms you're using, it's just passing bytes around. And the only processing that is that in the cryptographic, uh, the, only, the only other processing is um, getting a public key out of that credential to verify messages with. So as long as the credential specifies how you get a public key out of it, then that's enough um, to to make the protocol go. All right, fair enough. But then we're still left with the fact that the first three lines there on the left side, it pretty precisely specifies what a credential has to look like. And that's including a signature key pair, uh, the identity. And well, the signature scheme, which is actually not the case anymore. So that's deprecated, outdated anyway. I see what you mean. Yeah, so I think we could revise that to be to be clearer. Uh, to say that you know each type of credential had it, its main function is to 
provide a public key for use in verifying messages. And it's up to the credential type to say how that public key is derived. Um, in basic credential, it's just listed out there. In X509 credential, you have to parse it out of the leaf certificate. Okay, I see what you mean. Then and it could, let could me... be other could be other mechanisms for your for your multi scheme. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean. Okay, sure. That's that's fine. Um, then let me adjust this draft to to essentially mostly just fix the three points up there. Not the PR, I mean. Fantastic. Seems like a reasonable way forward. Okay, so the notes I'm taking here say we're going to re-add signature scheme on basic and um, clarify the requirements um, for credential types. While we're on the subject, I have a just a high-level question. Maybe maybe someone can answer. I was wondering how the setup would look. The idea is for MLS to be federated. Suppose one, you know, one server is an organization where everybody wants to use these curve two five five one nine, and the other one is like NIST curves, and then the third one is post quantum. I'm I want to prepare key packages so anyone, any person on any one of these servers, can invite me to a conversation from the get go. But I, how, how does how is that envisaged? Like do I do do I have key packages for curve? Credentials, other key packages for post quantum ones, and third one key package set of key packages, and they're all hosted on my AS. Or so, this... um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, in a key package, you can only have one public key, but you can list all the cipher suites you support. Uh, so, in order to have some partial prevention of downgrade attacks, um, but you would still have to have a dedicated key package for every cipher suite. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, so you would have to publish uh, multiple key packages for that. Okay. Which is just just more work at that point. Um, but then the uh, uh, the plus is that the key packages are going to be smaller. So I think the the idea was that you can request them from a server by saying, okay, I want to. I want to have a key package for this client supporting that cipher suite. And okay. so it would just give you the right key package. Um, but then, yeah, regarding the credential here, um, it would be awkward because of the different cipher suites if you have if you had different credentials that effectively belong to the same client. Um, I, I think that that's exactly the um, the idea we had here. But um, to motivated Conrad to, uh, to look into this. See, so in your description, you say, despite the fact that I have in my example three different pools of key packages, one pool per cipher suite, they would, every key package in every pool shares the exact same credential. And this credential, yeah, I, I, is that what you meant or? That's what yeah, I meant, at least. I don't know, Conrad. Are you, yeah, so the idea if you actually had one credential that, that supports all your keys that you have, that all your identity keys, then you can have just one pool for each cipher suite. Uh, if we don't have that, then you would have to have, um, like, for each signature scheme that you support, you would have to have all these pools again. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Rafael, could you repeat how the how we how this actually protects against downgrade? Because the server could just withhold the key packages that don't that kind of. Yeah, but at least you would know that the client supports that, and and you could see that the server is actively withholding stuff there. Uh, sorry, how could you see that? Because every key package advertises all the cipher suites that are supported by a client. Ah, I see. Okay, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Well, you you can see that one is missing. You don't know if the server's withholding it or if the client didn't provide one. Sure. Yeah. 
but you you right. typically assume that there would be a last resort key package of some sorts. Yeah. But um, but then the same should hold for the for the certificates, right? So otherwise you could downgrade, you can have the same downgrade attack for weak signature schemes on the credentials. Uh, sorry, not certificates, the credentials. Signature, signature scheme is part of the cipher suite. Yeah. Um, yes, sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry. Yeah. So what's the, the road forward here? I'm going to you address these few points and we close it at the next interim. Uh, I think so. That's what I wrote down at least. So I'm, I'm going to fix these three points and I'm going to put back the signature scheme information in the basic credential. And I think, I think that's it. That sounds like fine to me. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. On four oh six. Yeah. So I'll take that on. Um, yeah. So the the general feedback I've been receiving so far is that the uh, the mechanism is a useful one and that it's something we should look into doing. Um, and uh, so I updated the PR just ever so slightly. And uh, Brendan, your comments are spot on. So there is um, still one big part missing here. Uh, and that is what we do um, with the init secret. So in the initial proposal, I said we leave it empty completely. Uh, I think I'm convinced now we can do better than that. And Richard had the proposal that uh, we use the HPKE exporter. Um, as a mechanism. So the, the question here is, in, in security terms, what can we improve? Um, and the idea with that is that um, if we leave the init secret empty, then an attacker who wants to get into the group just needs to know uh, one of the node secrets um, that are relevant. So the, the new member is going to chem new commit secret to one of or to several nodes uh, in its co-path. So if you have the node secret, you would effectively be in the group, whether or not you know um, a previous um, in its secret or not. And uh, so the proposal here is that we derive a key pair from the key schedule and we publish the, the public key so that the new member has access to it. And then the new member can chem um, a key, so some sort of um, preliminary in its secret to that. And then uh, both sides, meaning existing members and the new member, can use the HPK exporter mechanism to derive an in its secret they would use for that commit. So that means that an attacker would also need to know the private key from this key pair that's derived at the, the key schedule. Uh, and that's strictly more than just knowing uh, one node secret. So we we have um, some improvement there in that sense. The uh, conversation here that was interesting to me that I want to get in was uh, I got the impression that people were getting cold feet about using the, the asymmetric mechanism for the init secret for all commits instead of just external commits. Which, if that's the case, I would love to know why, but it seems that if we want to allow this at all, then we should make sure that it's as secure as the original mechanism, and then we can just use one because it would be simpler. Well, it, uh, why would we need the, it for internal those, commits? Those two well, things not... are not necessarily in tension, right? You can have something that as, is as secure as possible for the case when someone is joining from the outside, while still having a mechanism that works for internal commits, a different mechanism for internal commits. Um, for and my, my thinking here is that like the asymmetric stuff that we would use for an external commit isn't necessary. It doesn't add anything in the internal commit case. And it creates an opportunity for an additional thing that could leak. So this, um, the ephemeral stuff that's generated for the HVKE um, encryption, you know, could be uh, a, a key that is you know, passed to someone else um, or uh, 
access by some attacker that wouldn't otherwise be involved. So yeah, it, it's not adding anything and it creates another thing that can leak. So I'm kind of inclined not to do it for the internal case. Well, my point is that it's um, a lot simpler for the implementation if there's only one major uh, flow for handling commits versus if you have to handle internal and external commits separately. That uh, indicates to me that there's going to be some sort of security difference between the two commits, which we don't. I think there is a security difference, pretty significant. Necessarily, an external commit does not require the committer to know the current key schedule, whereas an internal commit does. Yeah, that's correct. I second that. There, there's going to be a significant difference between these two. Uh, and, we, and we want that the definition to be there so we can see the ones that are going to be less secure, so to speak. What's the value in somebody who doesn't know the current key schedule? I mean, proving that somebody does, like, does that tell anything to the application or to the end user? Because I know that another thing that we're working on is allowing people to bootstrap themselves back into a group after they've like lost their state or something. So that's also something that we want to allow is people to rejoin without knowing the current state. So currently our commits have two ways in which they authenticate the sender, right? The signing keys and the fact that you know the current group schedule. We do that with various different mechanisms like the transcript hash and confirmation tag and now the macking in the plain text. With this external commit, we no longer have that second guarantee. We effectively have nothing more than what the signature provides us. So we can draw a whole ton of other stuff if that's all we care about. Then there's all kinds of simplifications we can make. What's the point of the confirmation tag in the macking if we don't care about the sender of the commit actually knowing the current group schedule, key schedule? We don't really get anything more than the signature. And just to point out what we're talking about, people re-adding into a group from a current uh, state, we're actually using PSKs to authenticate to that group state. So it's a little bit of a separate case from just an external commit that we're talking about here. I think that that's a great question, Joel, because I don't know the purpose of the confirmation tag. Again, it's a guarantee that whoever sends a commit is a member of the group and doesn't just know the signing key of a member. Well, I don't see the purpose it's, of it's that. Proof, it's a proof that they're a member of the group after the commit. Right, it's, it's a confirmation of the state of the group after the commit has been applied. I think it also verifies that they knew the initial key schedule because they were able to compute the key for the confirmation tag, confirmation key. Yeah, so right now it confirms they knew they knew the init secret. Um, right now, right now you have to know the init secret and the commit secret uh, mm -hmm. in order to um, compute the confirmation tag um, and all the intermediate stuff. Um, but the proposal in this external thing is that you would confirm instead that you knew the a public key derived from the init secret and you know an ephemeral key that was derived uh, as part of this external commit. Um, so you get um, you know, the confirmation you get is that either you were a member that you were, you were part of the group or you were the person joining, which I think is, is the best yeah. you could get in the external join case, um, but is looser than you need in the internal join internal commit case. Yeah. Also, sure. draw to your point, um, <clears throat> we we just look at the signature when we add a member through a welcome message as well. So we are going to leak the init secret to a new member just based on the signature. We already have that mechanism. That's true, because we need it for adding, but we don't wouldn't need it for an internal commit, right? No, not for an internal commit, but whenever we add people, so this is just another way of adding people. Uh, whenever we add people, um, stuff is not as robust anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I just don't think it's a good idea to make that those weaker guarantees, even when we wouldn't have to, like in the case of an internal commit. We can afford to make stronger guarantees, so I think it's a good idea to do that. 
I mean, then you end up in a, a sort of split case where some commits are more secure than others, and there's not a way to explain that to the user. Well, right, we, so we have a my... certain flexibility here uh, in the sense that external commits are optional, first of all. So in a, in a very tight setting, you can just disallow them. It's 12 hours. So um, I, I, we're at the top of the hour. I can leave this open, but I, I actually have to go. Um, so if you guys want to keep talking, that's fine. It's up to you guys. So from my side, what I'm going to propose is that uh, maybe Richard, Richard and I were going to hash out uh, what this would look like exactly. Add that to the PR um, for the next time. But whether we touch internal commits as well is a bit of an orthogonal discussion, um, which I'm happy to have as well, of course, but um, it's not directly linked to the idea of having external commits. I, I think that, um, Raphael, you and I can make this proposal a bit more concrete and elaborate some of the syntactical aspects um, and create a, a, a more mature PR for how we would do this as a separate external mechanism, um, and then uh, discuss probably in the next call whether to backport that to the internal commits as well. But yeah, I, I have to do it in that well, order. So, yeah, we can we can um, continue this on the list. Thanks, folks. See you later. Right, thanks, bye, everyone. Ciao.